Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's begin the show with the headlines first. Indian security forces neutralize two Lashkar terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir's Pulwama district. Taliban resurgence bring brutal punishments back to Afghanistan. And abduction of Baloch students spark protests amidst widespread human rights violations in Balochistan. In Jammu and Kashmir, Indian security forces are intensifying their efforts to dismantle the network of Pakistan-backed terrorism that has long plagued the region. In a recent operation in Pulwama district, forces engaged in a fierce encounter with terrorists, resulting in the elimination of two lashkar e taiba terrorists, notably their commander Riyastar. The event serves as a reminder of the threat posed by Pakistan-backed elements. Nonetheless, India's proactive counter-terrorism measures persist, ensuring the safety and security of the region's inhabitants. On the 3rd of June, a fierce confrontation unfolded between security forces and terrorists in the district of Pulwama in Jammu and Kashmir. This skirmish was instigated following the receipt of intelligence reports indicating the presence of terrorists in the vicinity. Swiftly, the security forces launched a cordon and search operation in Nihama area of the South Kashmir district. During the search operation, as the joint search party approached towards the suspected spot, the hiding terrorists fired indiscriminately upon the joint search party, which retaliated effectively, leading to an encounter. In the ensuing encounter, two lashkar e taiba terrorists, including a self-styled commander of the outfit, were killed. According to police officials, they have been identified as Riyaz Dar and Rais Dar. Riaz Dar was a commander of the band LAT and was wanted in several terror cases. He had been evading security forces for many years. Police ko ek itla mili thi regarding presence of terrorist in Nihama area. To uske baad wo input ko develop kiya gaya aur wahan pe district police Pulwama army aur CRPF counterpart ke saath us area ka muhasara kiya gaya. मुआसरा करने के बाद जब चेकिंग हो रही थी तो अंदर से वहां जो हमारी पार्टीज हैं उन पे गोली बरसाई गई तो उसके बाद ये जो सर्च ऑपरेशन है जो इनपुट के बिना पे आगे डेवलप हो रहा था वो एक एनकाउंटर में तब्दील हो गया तो ये आज सुबह से ये एनकाउंटर इसने जोर पकड़ा है अ लार्ज नंबर ऑफ टेररिस्ट्स विद बैकिंग फ्रॉम पाकिस्तान रिमेन कंसील्ड विद इन जम्मू एंड कश्मीर persistently seeking opportunities to execute acts of terror and disrupt the peace within the region. Yet, despite the nefarious intentions harbored by Pakistan-based terrorists, counter-terrorism operations have exhibited remarkable success in quelling the menace within Jammu and Kashmir. In the month of January this year, a lashkar e taiba terrorist who was involved in the killing of an army personnel and non-local laborers killed in an encounter with security forces in Jammu and Kashmir's Shopian district. Many experts opine that these operations have left anti-social elements in the region feeling powerless, as heightened security is applied to their logistical and financial support networks. Pakistan's persistent endeavors to disrupt the peace in India is not a new phenomenon. The problem with Pakistan is that it is now a failed state. It has nothing to show to the world except that it is an exporter of terrorism and that it is doing so by trying to send the terrorists into Kashmir Valley and tell the world or try to portray to the world that look Jammu and Kashmir is not safe, it is disturbed and the people over there they want independence. Whereas on ground reality, what it is, is Pakistan itself is in a deep crisis. 
In response to these unrelenting attempts, India has meticulously implemented a comprehensive framework designed to thwart individuals dispatched and supported by Pakistan. This multifaceted approach involves the Border Security Force intercepting drones engaged in the illicit transport of drugs and ammunition on Indian soil, while the National Investigation Agency conducts targeted raids to disrupt the financial networks supporting terrorists within India. Furthermore, India's deeply entrenched intelligence network plays a pivotal role by supplying crucial information that informs ground-level counter-terrorism operations conducted by the police and the army, thereby ensuring the preservation of peace in the Union territory despite Pakistan's recurrent malevolent endeavors. In a stark reminder of their oppressive rule, the Taliban have reintroduced brutal public punishments in Afghanistan, flouting international human rights standards. Recent reports reveal that 63 individuals, including women, were publicly flogged for various crimes, and at least five people were executed by gunfire. Despite initial promises of a more open and moderate rule, after coming to power in 2021, the Taliban's actions have drawn parallels to their regime in the late 1990s. For the past two years, Afghan women and girls have faced increasing exclusion from public life, including access to education and recreational spaces like parks and gyms. In a resurgence of harsh judicial practices, the Taliban have once again resorted to public floggings and executions, casting a shadow over human rights in Afghanistan. Recently, at least 63 people, including 14 women, were publicly flogged in northern Afghanistan after being convicted of crimes such as sodomy, theft and immoral relations. This marks the first instance of such a large group being publicly punished by the de facto authorities since their return to power in Kabul. Since regaining control in August 2021, the Taliban have conducted public floggings in sports stadiums across the country involving hundreds of men and women. Despite initial promises of a more moderate rule, the Taliban quickly reverted to severe public punishments, including executions, floggings and stonings, reminiscent of their previous regime in the late 1990s. The United Nations Mission for Afghanistan has decried judicial corporal punishments and executions in public under Taliban rule, saying they are prohibited under international human rights law. There is absolutely no difference. You see, the harsh punishments and the harsh codes of behavior they have used for civil offenses, offenses related to sex, etc., are as harsh, as barbaric as they were in 1996 when they first came. That time it was shocking because nobody actually had seen that kind of a thing before. It lasted for five years and all those five years were shocking. What has happened is, this is Taliban part 2, where they are doing exactly the same things after promising that they, 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 they would not. In March of this year, Taliban Supreme Leader Hibatullah Akhanzada declared that the group would reinforce its interpretation of Sharia law in Afghanistan, reintroducing public flogging and stoning for adultery. According to Afghan Witness, a research group monitoring human rights in Afghanistan, the Taliban ordered 417 public floggings and executions last year alone. Since their return, the Taliban have severely curtailed human rights, particularly impacting women's rights, freedom of expression and access to education and employment. 
institutions supporting human rights have been drastically limited or shut down entirely. Since August 15, 2021, the country has faced ongoing uncertainty, raising fears of human rights abuses against activists, former government employees, women and minorities. A recent UNEMA report highlights over 50 decrees that restrict women's freedoms, revealing a dire situation. The report notes increased police harassment in public spaces, further limiting women's ability to leave their homes. Alarmingly, 57% of women in Afghanistan feel unsafe leaving their homes without a male guardian. In urban Afghanistan, the informal economy always has been a large part of the economy where women have played some role. To come out with rules which prevent women from coming out unescorted by a male relative, that I think is damning for the women because their avenues of employment get eliminated. And it is damning for the overall economy because the urban economy to some extent in uh, to some extent depended on these women. Today, most countries don't recognize the Taliban as the official government of Afghanistan. The UN has stated that recognition is nearly impossible while bans on female education and employment remain in effect. The international community's primary contention with the Taliban centers on these bans. Since seizing power, the Taliban have mandated women to cover up when leaving home, barred girls and women from attending high school and university and ban them from parks, gyms and public baths. The Taliban dismisses criticism as external interference, insisting these bans are domestic matters. As Afghanistan grapples with its future, the conflict between the Taliban's authoritarian rule and demands for human rights and equality persists, leaving the nation's trajectory uncertain. Human rights violations in Balochistan have been a grave concern for years, with widespread allegations of enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, arbitrary arrests and suppression of free expression. Recently, the abduction of two Baloch students, Shahyak and Paruk Dutt, sparked a sit-in protest by their families in Quetta, demanding justice. Reports indicate thousands are missing with accusations that security forces are conducting extrajudicial killings to suppress Baloch self-determination. The issue of enforced disappearances in Balochistan has long marred Pakistan's human rights record. Victims include political activists, journalists, human rights defenders and students. Simply being suspected of sympathizing with separatists or having any remote link to them puts individuals at risk of abduction. Recently, two Baloch students, Shihak and Farooq Dad, were forcibly taken in Balochistan. In response, their family members staged a sit-in protest at the Commissioner House in Quetta, calling on people from all walks of life to join the struggle to reunite the disappeared with their families. The Baloch Yagjahiti Committee, a Baloch rights organization, highlighted this protest on social media, emphasizing the severe human rights abuses faced by residents, including abductions and extrajudicial killings. These protests aim to raise awareness about the alarming increase in enforced disappearances in the province. Guzishta dinno, even city se kuch talbat ko utaya gaya, jin me se panch ko to manzar ayam pe laya gaya, jab ke Farooq Baloch itta hal manzar ayam pe nahi laye gaye hain. Am subah se Koita DC office ke samne darna dekhe bete huye hain, magar ala ukam me se kisi ne bhi am se rapta nahi kia. 
और बजाय रबता करने के या हमारे मसाइल सुनने के वो उल्टा हम पे क्रैक डाउन करने की तैयारियां कर रहे हैं हम तमाम बलोच कौम से कोयटा के गयूर आवाम से दरख्वास्त करते हैं कि वो आए और हमारे धरने में शरीक हो द बलोच ह्यूमन राइट्स काउंसिल रिसेंटली सबमिटेड अ डिटेल रिपोर्ट टू द यूएन ह्यूमन राइट्स काउंसिल फॉर इट्स अपकमिंग 56th सेशन शेडिंग लाइट ऑन द इनफोर्स डिसअपीयरेंसेस एंड एक्स्ट्रा जुडिशियल किलिंग्स इन बलूचिस्तान The BHRC statement underscores the role of Pakistani security forces in these human rights violations which are part of an effort to suppress Baloch self-determination. The Voice for Baloch Missing Persons reports over 7000 missing individuals from Balochistan. In contrast, the Commission of Inquiry on Enforced Disappearances acknowledges only 450 active cases as of October 2023. Demonstrations against these atrocities are frequently held in Balochistan and globally. Protesters holding placards and banners chant slogans against the inhumane actions in Pakistan and urge the international community to condemn what they describe as genocide, arguing that global silence grants Pakistan impunity. Main problem why each and every government in pakistan has failed to recover or do something in favor of missing person and forced disappearances because they the people they been missing they are disappeared this is not the policy of government this is the policy of the state and the as concerned as the government government is always came on the shoulder of the same state this is true in pakistan most of the government elected people they are not elected by people they are selected by the same elements same institute same organization i mean pakistan isi and pakistan army they are involved in disappearances and in forced disappearances this is the reality and furthermore you can see even the pakistani judiciary is silenced and cannot do anything in favor of missing person and in for disappearance because pakistan isi and pakistan army keep them blackmailing thousands have disappeared in balochistan over the years due to a harsh military crackdown global media have repeatedly highlighted the discovery of hundreds of bodies believed to be those of suspected separatists and political activists suggesting extrajudicial killings by Pakistani security forces a recent report by pank the human rights wing of the baloch national movement documented 19 cases of torture 90 enforced disappearances and 3 extrajudicial killings in may 2024 alone This pattern of state repression aims to silence the voices of the oppressed in this impoverished region. The families of the disappeared endure immense suffering, living in constant uncertainty about their loved ones' fates. Many relatives have died with the anguish of never knowing what happened to their missing family members, passing away with the pain of unfulfilled hopes and unanswered questions. As Pakistan prepares to unveil its annual budget on June 10th, economic concerns loom large on the horizon. Despite hopes for the budget to address pressing issues, economic experts in the Islamic Republic fear that it may exacerbate rather than elevate the country's woes. With Pakistan's central bank highlighting structural challenges and political uncertainties, the imminent budget announcement underscores the critical need for comprehensive reforms a report pakistan will present its annual budget on june 10th and markets are awaiting details of the plans seen as crucial to securing a new international monetary fund loan but economic experts say they do not have much hope instead woes are likely to rise 
The country faces significant challenges including high inflation, a poverty rate of nearly 40% and reliance on foreign debt to fund its expenses. Economic activity has been slow in Pakistan for the last two years as it has been beset by inflation above 20% since May 2022 while it navigated reforms as part of a previous IMF bailout. Some economic experts believe that new budget will likely bring more price hikes and taxes. Budget जो होता है ना, उन्हें तो तोर पे एक relief का नाम है। Budget जो तरक्की तरफ, तरक्की की तरफ गांवतन होने का एक नाम है। लेकिन हमारी budget आती है गरीब मिस्किन आदमी को महंगाई के ऊपर। आप देखिए कितनी महंगाई बढ़ गई है और महंगाई कंट्रोल नहीं हो पा रही है। the economic experts from Pakistan are expressing concern about the government's approach to economic policies, particularly in response to advice from institutions like the IMF. They suggest that the upcoming budget is unlikely to effectively control inflation because of the inadequacy of Pakistan's policies. They point out that the frequent introduction of mini-budgets contribute to inflation rather than curbing it. A recent report by Pakistan's Central Bank paints a somber picture, citing structural bottlenecks compounded by political uncertainty as hindrances to economic progress. Despite modest improvements in macroeconomic indicators, the forecasted GDP growth of 2% to 3% for fiscal year 2024 underscores the uphill battle facing Pakistan's economy. As Pakistan braces for the unveiling of its budget amidst mounting economic challenges, the apprehensions raised by experts like Rehmatullah underscore the pressing need for comprehensive reforms to stir the country towards sustainable growth and prosperity. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.